to welcome everybody. Good morning for those people on the east, on the western coastline of Australia and through to Singapore, etc. And uh, good afternoon to people on the eastern seaboard and in New Zealand. Today is our final day or final presentation for our, the One Spatial World Fair presentations. And we are promising you a great lineup of presenters and um, information about FME. Before we get too far down the lines, I'll just take this opportunity to run a short video that will give you a run through on One Spatial and what we offer. And it also provides a bit of time for stragglers to, to join in. Thank you for those who are attending and welcome again. My name is Andre Mikika, Country Manager for One Spatial Australia. I'd just like to take this opportunity to just run through what One Spatial is about and what we have to offer. One Spatial is an international company that has been around for over 50 years, providing solutions in the spatial industry uh, with regard to software solutions. We have offices in all over the world with our head office being in Cambridge in the UK, offices in Ireland, Belgium, France, Tunisia, United States, and within Australia as well. Within Australia, we have our head office in Sydney, we have an office in Melbourne and a office in Canberra. We partner with a number of organizations as far as pro providing technology, as you can see there with Esri, Oracle, etc. But our major partner, particularly for in here in Australia is Safe Software, where we provide the FME product to customers throughout Australia and uh, into the A APAC region. Our key industries that we work in uh, government, utilities, transport, mining, um, construction, AEC environments, etc. As you can see there from our um, some of our customers that we deal with, we deal with uh, 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 government, federal government, state government, local government, construction firms, and we'll be also hearing from Hancock Victorian Plantations as well as from our good partner from Spatial Partners uh, later on today. And later on in our presentations, so we'll be talking about a bit more about FME. Who we are 
is we are a software solutions provider, a global expert in managing location and geospatial data. We are striving to make the world safer, smarter, and more sustainable for our futures. We help our customers to unlock the value of their data to create a smarter world. And we deliver powerful data solutions and applications on-premise, mobile, and in the cloud. We are a customer-centric business that delivers solutions to address our customers' needs, and we are collaborative with the people that we deal with. As you can see from our video that was being playing before, we have a comprehensive suite of offerings, which range from our one spatial management suite, which is our location master data management, where we provide a number of applications, but of major, major interest, especially for today, is our um, one into, uh, sorry, our FME product range that we provide, being desktop, server, cloud, and there'll be more information on that as we go through our presentation today. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce everybody to the team at One Spatial Australia. We have Andrew Bashfield, our sales manager, Simon Laird, our services lead, Emma Yates, our marketing manager, Tom Farrington, who we'll be hearing from later on today, our senior consultant and also our manager of our training. Daniela White, who is, uh, works in our sales team as, and also coordinates the training program along with Tom. Michael Studdard, consultant. Priyantha Palagama, a senior consultant and also the manager of our support team. Sam McDonald, senior consultant, and Ashish Mandana, Manandaha, a senior consultant, and myself, Andre Mikika, as the country manager. And I'm very proud to have this team of highly professional people available to service everyone's needs. Today's attractions. We're going to get a message from Adi Bagatari, our the APAC channel manager for Safe Software, and he's going to run through more detail on what Safe is all about and what the offerings are. We are going to have some very comprehensive and great presentations from some customers. We're going to have some magic tricks for taming wild external systems from Jonathan Stanger, Spatial Partners, as well as from Brett Higman from Hancock Victorian Plantations on using data to drive decision-making with FME. We will then be followed up with a Q and A session with Safe Software and the One Spatial team. So before we get started, I'd just like to highlight that we welcome questions and would ask you if you have got questions during the presentations that you go to the chat box and type in your question. We will endeavor to get to that question at the conclusion of the presentations. If we don't manage to answer the questions, we will get back to you with answers in afterwards. We would also welcome people to ask questions at the end of the presentations. If you want to actually ask the questions in person, put your hand up and then we'll unmute you and then you'll be able to ask the questions. So please put in your questions. We welcome them. On that, I'd like to now take this opportunity to introduce Artie, our channel account manager from Safe Software, and hand it over to you, Artie, to present your about Safe Software. Over to you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Andre. And uh, good afternoon and good morning, everyone. And good evening for those. I know there's a couple of uh, uh, safers on the line as well. So uh, from all over the world, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Artie, and I have the pleasure of working very closely with our partners, including One Spatial, as a channel account manager for Asia Pacific. And today, we're going to uh, do a high-level overview of the FME platform and an introduction to Safe Software for those who might be new to FME and Safe Software. This is a common data uh, challenge that we see with many organizations uh, 
organizations and different departments within the organization tend to buy the best application fit for their needs. And when these applications and data are not integrated properly, it can cause challenges getting information in and out of these systems. And that's how the silos begin. And that's how the, the challenge with data integrity begins. And that's also what causes to uh, requiring more manual work in order to get information in and out of these systems. Whereas with FME, uh, we combine all types of data and all types of applications in a no code environment. Uh, our platform is, has a very wonderful visual interface that's GUI based, so it's all drag and drop, and it does not require the knowledge of any coding or scripting. And it allows you to connect, combine all your applications, spatial and non-spatial, and provide the information needed to the end user in order to allow for not just faster decision making, but higher quality integrity of the data, and also completing all types of conversions as necessary and translations and migrations as well. Safe Software has been around for uh, a little bit over 25 years now. Uh, our organization started back in 1993 when our two co-founders, Doug, uh, Don and Dale, uh, they were working with the BC government and they uh, were solving some spatial data challenges that the government was facing at that time. And uh, that's where the concept of FME began. And FME and Safe Software has only grown from there. And today we have the great pleasure of working with over 10,000 organizations worldwide. Uh, you will find FME in over 128 different countries. And of course, as a software vendor, we don't provide professional services or support. Uh, we focus on the platform itself. And this is the reason why as to why we work with a network of global partners, such as One Spatial, to provide our customers with not just local pricing, but as well as local services and local support in the local time zones as well, and be an extension of our organization. So this is the FME platform that you see here. And our journey with the FME platform always starts to the far left with FME Desktop. And FME Desktop is where you go and build and you run your workflows. And this is where you start building your data integration uh, connections. And uh, not sure if you're able to see based on this picture or not, but as you can see, it's all uh, drag and drop and the documentation of it is quite simple, which reduces any sort of uh, manual intervention in order to uh, modify or expand and or, or scale uh, new additions for integrations or new workflows in your workspaces. Uh, once you've built and uh, uh, started building your workflows and you want to get into automation, uh, that's where FME Server comes into play. And FME Server is the automation piece to the platform. And this allows you to not only focus on event-based triggers, but perhaps things that might trigger a database, such as you know, new customer information coming or a new work order coming through a system that needs to be processed and routed uh, uh, accordingly. Now, FME Desktop and FME Server are both on-premise solutions. Um, but the deployment options are uh, quite agnostic. Uh, we work with and uh, are flexible with working with multiple different infrastructures and cloud platforms. But for customers that don't want to worry about the infrastructure and they want a hosted version of FME server, they have the option of FME cloud. And FME cloud is the exact interface of FME server with the only exception being it's hosted on Safe Software's AWS infrastructure. So we, uh, can, we take care of all the infrastructure uh, uh, costs and, and headaches for uh, the customer. And of course, as we continue to move into the world of mobile, uh, we're investing heavily on the FME mobile side. And you'll see some very cool applications that have been built using FME mobile, especially on the AR side. And uh, of course, we are looking at uh, um, Android as well, since right now FME mobile is only available on iOS, but Android will be coming down the road. <clears throat> this is a wonderful slide to show the uh, different types of data that we've uh, continued to add to our uh, portfolio over the past few years. You know, back when uh, Don and Dale first started with Safe Software, it was a lot of CAD to GIS. And as our organization started to grow and our customers' needs started to grow, 
uh, we start to support more and more data types, uh, which is why you know we start adding things such as databases, uh, big data, uh, BI, and we have a wonderful relationship with Apple on the indoor mapping side. And of course, we're also moving into this world of augmented reality and artificial machine learning. Uh, so you know we're totally trying to make sure that FME can continue to support any types of applications and data that you'll be requiring for your organization to allow for uh, not just the decision making, but also to remove any sort of manual and human uh, intervention when it comes to integrating data. We had the pleasure of being recognized by Gardner uh, last year as uh, for the first time on the Magic Quadrant. Uh, you'll see us over here on the bottom uh, left quadrant uh, right above Hitachi Ventera under the niche category. And this not only speaks to our uh, expertise of being strong uh, in spatial data integration, but it also speaks volume to our overall approach to being an enterprise data and application integration platform. And uh, you know we're very proud of this and this could definitely not have been achieved without the help of our wonderful partners as well as our customers. So we're very thankful for this recognition. We work with multiple different technology partners, uh, such as Esri, CityWorks, Microsoft, IBM. Uh, one of the most recent technology partners that we've uh, had the pleasure of working with is Snowflake on the cloud database side. And uh, these uh, platforms are allowing us to continue to scale FME in not just new industries, but also new use cases and uh, uh, you know, accessing and supporting new applications as they come up. As I mentioned earlier, FME is uh, data agnostic and can be deployed in multiple different uh, variations, whether that's on Mac, uh, Windows, Linux, Docker, or Kubernetes. Uh, it's completely up to you. We're open. And uh, for customers that uh, don't uh, want to worry about, again, hosting FME server on their infrastructure and worry about the processing time and such, we have the option of hosting it for you on uh, with FME Cloud, where it's hosted on our AWS infrastructure. You'll also find us on the uh, Google Cloud Marketplace and also on the Microsoft Azure Marketplace. Um, this is where you can uh, deploy FME right in your virtual machine, right out of these marketplaces. Uh, what you will note is that it is a bring your own license uh, model. So if you currently don't have an FME license, uh, please reach out to the team over at OneSpatial to coordinate that. And if you do have a license and you're looking to uh, put it on your virtual machine on, on Google Cloud or Microsoft Azure, uh, the process is fairly simple, but if necessary, we're always happy to help out. And lastly, as always, uh, feel free to visit us at safe.com slash trial to get your hands on the FME platform and uh, get the value of uh, not just building your workspaces, but also automating it with FME server. And please you know, reach out to the team over at OneSpatial or to SAFE if necessary to help out with uh, coordinating the trial licenses or even the extensions of it as well. And with that being said, uh, I want to uh, greatly thank everyone for uh, listening to me today. And thank you to OneSpatial for allowing me to present. And I will pass the floor back over to you. Thank you very much, Adi, and thank you again for all your help over the uh, World Fair. Been very much appreciated. My pleasure. Okay. Now, it takes, gives me great pleasure to introduce Jonathan Stanger, uh, Director and Head Solutions Architect at Spatial Partners. Jonathan and I have known each other for a number of years now. And uh, when I first started with One Spatial, Jonathan was one of the first people I came across. And uh, his enthusiasm for FME is uh, second to none. So I'd like to welcome Jonathan and hand it over to you. And I'll just give you permission to control the screen. Over to you, Jonathan. Welcome. Unmuted. Hello, everybody. Hopefully everybody can hear me and uh, I'll just quickly stop my video again. And all right, let's jump into it. And here we go, clicking, there we go. All right, thanks for everyone coming to listen to the talk that I'm going to give. 
uh, magic tricks for taming wild external systems using SSH tunnels and high volume HTTP calls. I've really tried to lean into the theme here. So my proper job title is Senior Solution Architect. However, I do like to joke that uh, I have the job title of being a literal wizard, uh, as some of the things I managed to come up with are, you know, can somewhat appear like magic. Uh, so this talk uh, is really focused around, despite FME having just such an amazing breadth and depth of features, uh, there are occasional edge cases that you come across where there maybe are some limitations. And there are two specific cases that uh, I've come across that uh, represent some of the limitations that I've then figured out methods to overcome. One represents cases where uh, you're unable to access a particular data source because it's locked behind tightly controlled firewalls and the data is too risky to open up to external access, making it a bit tricky to get a say cloud hosted version of FME server to access it. And the other, is if you need to send a lot of HTTP requests, you may find some uh, difficulties in terms of speed for your uh, FME workbench completing. And so the first thing I will discuss is SSH tunnels or digital sapping for secure products. So what is the motivation? So if you've got a sensitive and secure set of data, and this can really present significant cybersecurity risks if you're going to allow external connections, if you're going to open up a database to just anyone out on the net being able to connect. So how do we safely let this dangerous beast out of its cage so FME can tame it? Well, if you've got a on-prem database or GIS service that's hosting some kind of sensitive or secure data, you can really run into a bit of a headache, particularly if when you're trying to automate or uh, create some kind of ETL pipeline, uh, you're needing to interact with other secondary services, which may not be available from within that highly secure environment. And some data is so sensitive that the potential impact of uh, the risk of exposing that out and having a potential breach is too high. So there, it is not an option at all to be able to expose this to public connections. Uh, and so that pretty much leaves you with very little option at that stage, which would be potentially just going with an on-prem hosting of the FME server within that secure environment, which potentially can drive up cost if you're needing to integrate with a large number of different systems, or could uh, sort of limit the functionality or limit the, your ability to actually leverage the use of that FME server because it's now dedicated to a very restricted environment. So the challenge really is, can we find a way to leave the firewall in place without increasing the cybersecurity risk? And there's a particular way that you can get around this. And this is by basically taking advantage of SSH tunnels to effectively create an encrypted pipeline between two servers. And so this is quite often implemented in a manner where the very secure server is able to connect out to a bastion server, which sits at the edge of your secure network. And then FME server is able to you know, connect into that. And then a end-to-end -end pipeline is created. So then it appears as if this very secure service is now being hosted right next to your FME server. And with a bit of clever, you know, careful configuration on the Bastion server, you can basically narrow this all the way down so that only known people who are very well authenticated are allowed to actually make the connections. And since you've got an encrypted pipeline along the way, it's quite secure. So how do we actually make that work? Well, uh, on a FME workbench, you have the fantastic ability of being able to add in a startup Python script and a shutdown Python script. So this is the really technical one. And unfortunately, this does require a bit of technical knowledge, but we can use OpenSSH. And this allows us to effectively using the startup script to start spawn basically a second little process where we execute the little command that's templated down in the bottom of this slide. And then that opens up the tunnel making the service available for FME and the rest of the workbench to interact with it as if you're hosting that service right there. 
And then when you get to the other end of the workbench, even if the workbench has failed for some reason, the shutdown will make sure to clean up that secondary service that's been running and therefore be able to uh, make sure that those that port is freed up for use later. So in what situation might one have used this? So the first example that actually inspired us to start developing this was we were working with an organization who surprisingly, completely non-GIS, wanted to be able to synchronize uh, the data from a large number of client databases, and it was financial data. Now, the databases had a couple of different schemas depending on which site it was on, creating a bit of complexity in terms of interacting. And if we were to do this uh, by bringing FME server on-prem, it would make it prohibitively expensive. So then the question becomes, how do you expose this financial data to FME so that it can synchronize and consolidate all that data and push it up into a cloud service? And so this is what we did. We then used this Bastion server to be able to bring all, basically open it up so that FME could be running simultaneous multiple workbenches, synchronizing from each of the databases and bringing all that data together into one place. And a alternative example is one that we never actually had to use in the end because due to some modifications of underlying infrastructure, we were actually able to get away with not needing to do this. But we had encountered cases where there was some uh, GIS data that was very commercially sensitive and also some another part of the set that contained very private personal data. And we needed to be able to, based on a request, be able to package that up into a payload and it needed to interact with other services. And so this was a bit of an issue if we were going to have to bring everything in house. And so this could have been solved by being able to reach in and retrieve that highly secure and sensitive data uh, while also interacting with other third party services to be able to build up your payload to deliver. So now onto the one that I'm really excited about. This is the asynchronous HTTP caller. So this is all about promises and knowing the right time to wait. So if you've got very high volumes of HTTP calls, this can result in your workbenches wasting approximately 95% of your engine time just waiting for network traffic to finish. So if you've ever been waiting in a line for a roller coaster and thinking, ah, please, when's my turn? Imagine your poor features waiting for their turn to get out there onto the net. So in terms of the challenges, so sometimes, you're facing situations where because you don't have control over the API that you're actually communicating with, you are forced into a situation where you're needing to retrieve, uh, either request or post data in terms of thousands of HTTP calls uh, so as to complete your workbench. Uh, and unfortunately, FME's native HTTP call only really supports making a single connection at a given time. And this is quite a reasonable constraint because if you're throwing thousands and thousands of simultaneous connections at a service, you're going to be blocked very quickly and you may make some people that maintain those servers very upset. But sometimes that pro provides quite a challenging uh, constraint to us. And so as a quick little bit of benchmarking, using the FME's HTTP caller, uh, simulating some uh, web scraping, getting from the website, uh, where you can get a thousand copies of a specific website in about a minute. And if we're working with a commercial map API to pull down features, uh, if we're doing that one at a time, we can get a thousand features. And this is all these times are relative. So please do not take them as absolute. But uh, it took about 310 seconds. And then this is really highlighting the, the motivator that we ran into which was at one point we were asked to do a uh, post update for uh, over HTTP calls for 70,000 features. Uh, and that ended up taking six hours for the workbench to complete. And was the workbench really running efficiently at that time? Not necessarily. So this brings me to sort of explaining a little bit of the technology about how we actually ended up solving this. So there's a difference between CPU bound and network bound processes. So CPU bound is if the computer needs to do a lot of thinking. And the only way to really get around that is to have more CPUs to do more thinking. And so this is where you get sort of a, a multi-processing approach. But some processes are really limited more by network traffic and waiting for a server on the other end to actually respond. 
And so this is where a multi-threading approach can actually work quite well, where effectively the computer starts something. And this is the promised asynchronous code pattern, where it's a, instead of getting a response straight away, it starts a request and then it will come back later to see whether or not it's finished. And in that in intervening time, it can go and do something else, like send another request. And then the last thing that's a little bit clever uh, is Spatial Partners has been figuring out how to pack a bunch of Python code into a single FMX transformer, which almost worked perfectly. Uh, however, I did run into a little bit of trouble uploading it to the FME hub just before this session. However, if you do type async HTTP caller uh, and into the, your FME workbench, you should find the async HTTP caller hub, which is a custom transformer that contains this transformer, as the FME hub did not allow me to upload my FMX file. However, this uses Python 3 standard libraries, so it's compatible with effectively any of the uh, FME versions that uh, have at least Python 3.6 or newer and utilizes standard libraries. It's being released with MIT open source license uh, explicitly, so totally fine for use in commercial environments. And it tries very hard to mimic the HTTP caller interface to make it very familiar and to be able to do some, uh, you know, basically use it plug and play. It's quite exciting. I really love this transformer. So, as an example, a commercial uh, web map platform that uh, Spatial Partners use, uses quite frequently, looking to do some automations with it, uh, which is GIS Cloud. It's, this is common for a number of other GI, uh, sort of web-based GIS services, such as um, ArcGIS Online. You can usually get features in a large bulk request, but actually updating a feature to change the attributes. So if you're really talking about like a deep level of automation, uh, quite often the APIs only allow you to update one feature at a time. So if you're going to do that, you and you have a very large number of features that you need to update, it's a bit of a challenge. And so having a look at the comparison, if we're comparing the previous performance of uh, FME's native transformer, where it was actually spending over 95% of its time just waiting, not actually doing any work, if we now use the async caller, and we use 20 threads, brings it down to a minute, and 35 threads down to only 30 seconds. And at that point, the CPU is actually working the whole time. And so it's the most efficient possible use and 10 times faster. And so uh, another example, uh, we were actually asked to uh, extract from a fairly complex data model, a regular daily sync of data up into a cloud application for use for field applications. And uh, this required us, because we weren't in control of the API, to make approximately 150,000 post requests per day. And when we were looking at the response speed and the time taken to do all of that, we realized it was actually, we were estimating it was going to take more than a day to synchronize one day's worth of data. So we brought the async HTTP caller into the mix and uh, we were able to bring that down to approximately an hour per day to be able to achieve that same synchronization task simply by establishing multiple parallel connections to send that data through. And then another example uh, that may be quite valuable from a GIS perspective is uh, using the HTTP caller to make WFS or WMS calls. And this would allow you to bulk download large volumes of data from a WFS service. And so as a quick little example, I'm just getting 25 collections using, which totaled up to uh, about 20 megabytes worth of data. If we're only using the native FME HTTP caller, then it's about 20 seconds and takes a bit of time because we're going through one at a time. But if we bring in a few more threads, we can bring that down to uh, basically halve the amount of time. But this also highlights that sometimes some of the services, this was actually a public service that I was just testing quietly against. And uh, as I increase my number of threads, I have a feeling it may have started to throttle me, which is why the uh, performance in terms of idle time started to actually go back up again. And this is something that you do need to be careful with. Um, in terms of uh, web scraping or possibly using high volume geocoding with a service that FME doesn't currently support yet, then you could do this as well. 
which is another example. And we can see here that we can drastically increase the uh, execution time to be able to pull in all the data from repeatedly scraping, in my, our case, the spatial partner's website. Uh, and then lastly is the uh, FME server, which even that mighty API sometimes has a few edge cases, uh, particularly if you need to use, do some fairly advanced filtering on some of the endpoints. Uh, and so things like selectively purging logs from the server or retrieving multiple workbench results and consolidating them together uh, or consolidation of multiple work, uh, sorry, log files, all of these cases may possibly result in you making a fairly high volume and therefore may be wanting to use the async caller. Uh, and so conclusion, secure access to on-prem data is possible, but it's not necessarily easy. You do need a bit of technical knowledge. And the high volume HTTP calls are now available, but please use responsibly. And that is me. Any questions? Thank you, Jonathan. I'm just having a look to see if there's anybody that's wanting to put their hand up. I cannot see. I, I couldn't work out how to make uh, comments or anything, but I would hopefully be able to get access to this, um, the slide pack or a workbench. Do you have a sample workbench? So if you're wanting to get access to the uh, asynchronous HTTP caller, you should be able to find it on the FME hub. So it should be available for download very easily. Hopefully. So I'm in two meetings, but yeah, I, I can see the async thing. That's fine. Thank you. It's a great, um, great presentation. Very, very pertinent at the moment. So uh, with regard to that, uh, this video or this presentation will be available later for on online. So if you need to review or if you think you missed something, you, you're more than welcome to get that as well. And uh, yeah, as Jonathan said, it's on, on the uh, hub. I can't see any other questions. Thank you for your question. There doesn't seem to be any others. No one has actually typed in any questions. So Jonathan, Thank you very, very much for your presentation. As always, very informative, and uh, we look forward to catching up soon. I will now like to introduce Barrett Hing Higman, GIS officer at um, Hancock Victorian Plantations. Uh, Barrett has uh, is not a stranger to doing presentations at the FME World Tour or World Fairs. He uh, is a regular contributor and um, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you, Barrett, and look forward to hearing your presentation. Over to oh, you, thank Barrett. Thank you very much. I'll just give you control. So you can control the slides. Away you go. Okay. See how this goes. Seems like there's a bit of a lag there, perhaps. There we go. Um, yeah, so uh, as uh, um, Andre said, I'm, uh, I work for Hancock Victorian Plantations uh, um, as a GIS officer in the northern region. Um, I'm based out of, uh, of northeast Victoria in Myrtleford. Um, and uh, yeah, I just thought I'd, I'd take you through some of the, the journey that we've had over the last 12 months of introducing uh, FME to uh, this organisation. Um, and I've also uh, I've changed the slides up a bit from the uh, the fairground uh, theme and uh, and included a bunch of uh, pretty photos of all of our trees. So uh, all these photos are from our, our region up here in the north. Um, so HVP, plantations, um, we have a um, significant amount of land under our management, uh, approximately 245,000 uh, hectares of land or 593,000 acres. 
Um, we supply about 3 million tonnes of plantation wood uh, per year. Um, and we also uh, manage approximately 50,000 hectares uh, or 123,000 acres of uh, native forest for conservation purposes. We uh, also have around about 160 uh, people working for us, both as staff and harvesting haulage and silviculture uh, contractors. We also maintain eight forestry industry fire brigades and spend about a million dollars on firefighting and, and uh, fire protection per year. Um, we're also the, the largest private timber plantation, or one of the largest private timber plantations in Australia. And uh, we're owned by a combination of Australian, Canadian and US super and uh, investment funds. I'll lag with the slides. Um, so, as you can imagine, those are some reasonably big numbers. Um, we, uh, we cover obviously a, a very large uh, geographic area. Um, and along with those sort of uh, large stats, we, it means that we uh, have to maintain some significant uh, data sets. And obviously this uh, creates some significant data management challenges. So we, uh, we have a decentralized uh, data architecture. We have about eight offices spread over three regions, uh, Northern, Western and Gippsland. Um, so we stretch from all the way in the Southwest um, from Mount Gambier, which is not actually in Victoria, but uh, all the way from Mount Gambier up to uh, our um, Shelley office, which is near Talangata in the sort of far Northeast. Um, the decentralization has always been uh, necessary in the past uh, due to some of those remote sites having uh, some limited bandwidth um, with the internet. Um, and so we rely on a, a process of checking data in and out on a regular schedule um, to ensure there's a um, um, good performance. Um, though even though the data is decentralized quite significantly, uh, we do have a very mature corporate data structure um, it's uh, consistent across all the regions and there's also a heavy reliance um, on uh, that spatial data within the organisation and the GIS um, technology stack um, and its associated data is well and truly recognised as an essential business tool, um, which uh, um, is recognised all the way up to the, the very top of the organisation. So how did FME become part of, uh, of all of this? So um, prior to uh, FME being introduced into the organisation, um, ETL processes certainly existed, but um, it was in a variety of methods uh, and authored by um, a variety of people. Um, so we had everything from sort of VBA and Excel macros, Python R, ISRI model builder floating around and also some um, SQL processes. But um, what that usually meant is processes had to be run in stages. Um, it, uh, it obviously um, meant that there was a, a bit of a lack of transparency as um, those um, various methods uh, mentioned generally require specialized skills. And it also means there's a lack of consistency across different processes. Um, and that's often based on people's level of skill and, and the styles in which they, they create these uh, processes. So, in uh, the summer of uh, 1920, as everyone would be aware, we um, went through the uh, Black Summer bushfires. Um, and in amongst all the devastation that was caused by those fires, uh, HVP itself lost around 6,000 hectares of plantation or 14,800 um, acres. And uh, although we have managed to salvage uh, about half of that since the fires, um, during that time, been a person that's not a stranger to FME and um, been under quite a significant amount of pressure as I was only about two months into the job, um, having to uh, build certain reports and, and uh, track reports, uh, or sorry, track resources on the fire ground meant that I was sort of reaching for the tools that uh, I knew well to try and undertake some of those tasks. Um, so hence the reason why I downloaded a trial version of FME and started using it. And then after the fires were finished, uh, safe software, offered free FME licenses to organisations that were impacted by the bushfires for use during recovery operations. Um, HVP took them up on this uh, very generous offer and uh, obtained a 12 month FME desktop license that we used to help map and plan the 
salvage and, and um, harvesting and silviculture operations. We also at the same time, or a very similar time, we also purchased a, a fixed FME desktop license. Uh, the business case that we developed uh, centered mainly around uh, having a, an independent piece of software, something that was not associated with our um, GIS tech stack um, to undertake uh, validations on the data replication process. So just to ensure that everything that we were checking in from our um, data replication process was actually making its way into our corporate data set. That was sort of the, the main driver um, for that, uh, um, that purchase. So around about 12 months ago, um, the picture looked very much like this. Uh, we had uh, two desktop licenses. One was the, um, the 12 month um, and one was a, our own fixed license. And we had about two users, um, basically myself and, and my manager up here in Northern. And then um, we started using FMA, of course, within the business. And so things start to grow. So now we have approximately five FME desktop licenses within the organization. Uh, we also have uh, an FME server engine and we have about uh, 10 people who are trained and um, most of them are regular users as well. So we had quite a large amount of growth in a very short space of time. So why the significant increase? So. HVP Plantations in the past has, has invested very heavily in producing um, complete, consistent and accurate data sets. So as mentioned previously, we have quite mature uh, data sets. And I guess what we're trying to do now is, is start investing in, in producing complete, consistent and accurate outputs from those data sets. We're trying to... Uh, basically get to a point where we can start to um, use our data to actually uh, make the decisions for us. So FME started its life at HVP uh, very much as a tool being used in a single region, that being Northern, uh, to solve regional problems. Um, but its use is now expanding very much to a corporate level. Um, of course, one of the significant strengths of FME is the consistency by which the a process can be run and output produced. And due to the mature nature of our corporate data and consistent nature of it, it became very clearly early on that it was possible to develop processes in one region and then roll them out to the organization as a whole, even when that data is decentralized. Um, these are our three uh, regions, Gippsland, Northern and Western. And it does kill me that it's not called Eastern. Um, for consistency sake, but never mind. That's history. And we've realized quite a lot of benefits from this. Um, so obviously, um, some of these benefits have been both expected and unexpected. Uh, I guess consistency of output um, is uh, of huge benefit to us. And it's also a huge benefit to our, our contractors as well who rely on those outputs. So having that sort of across the, the regions, uh, we use in some cases, the same contractors. And so ensuring that the same uh, output is given in each region is, uh, is very useful. Um, we've also allowed to, uh, well, now that we're starting to allow the data to make the decisions as part of uh, the, the processes that we're putting in place, it does mean that any errors that are, that are highlighted in the data uh, can be found and, and fixed. And this means that instead of changing the actual output itself, it means we change the underlying data and then rerun the process because it's so quick to, to reproduce the, the output. And that means that the output itself is improved, uh, but it also means that any subsequent use of the same data uh, is improved as well because we're always getting the same um, correct answers from that corrected data. Um, it also means that we can uh, use consistent business rules across the organization. We're able to provide um, outputs um, that while they might not necessarily be the final answer, they can be refined uh, simply by removing records from a data set rather than to having to add records that satisfy the business rules. Of course, it's much easier to provide something with uh, more than what they uh, necessarily want and have them 
uh, remove the, uh, what um, they don't want them, rather than hunt around for things that they want to add. Um, the outputs from the processes also allow for better understanding of the documented business rules. Certain records keep appearing and not relevant. Um, it means that we can also uh, refine those uh, business rules to stop that, uh, those uh, um, records from appearing and that then clarifies better the business rules that we're using and obviously improves the understanding of the uh, process as a whole for the organisation. So I was just going to run through a couple of, uh, of case studies where we've uh, utilised uh, um, FME in, in recent times. Um, basically, as a uh, this uh, where we've utilised this as a corporate tool rather than as a uh, as a, a regional tool. Um, so, as part of uh, um, our uh, growing of trees, we undertake assessments of one-year-old plantations to uh, determine the survival rates uh, of those plantations. Um, plantations are always slightly overstocked at planting time to account for losses in the first year of the plantation. And the assessors count the number of healthy, dead, missing or sick trees within a fixed radius at locations that are randomly chosen throughout those one-year-old plantations. These numbers are used to derive a percentage survival of the planted trees and also a percentage survival of the stocking rate that we we're actually aiming for in that plantation. And the timing of the final data output is very important as it needs to occur prior to the current year's planting season so that any failed plantations can then be consisted, uh, considered for replanting in that current year. The outputs from this process are both spatial and report based and formally the processing of the results was done in the regions individually and then collated afterwards. However, this year all the results were processed centrally and a consistent set of spatial data sets um, and Excel reports um, and hard copy maps were produced for all the regions. And the timing was improved um, by over a week um, with further identified changes. So we're hoping to improve upon that um, next year as well. And an added benefit was the same process was used to identify gaps in the historic data as well. So going back uh, numerous years um, of uh, survival uh, reports, um, we were able to sort of correct um, gaps in that data and then uh, generate reports going about, uh, back about six, six years in a, in a consistent manner so the information could be compared year on year across a region and also um, within a region. Um, another case study uh, is uh, foliar sampling. Um, so uh, young trees and, and older trees in, in plantations that have been thinned are uh, sampled each year to determine if there's any uh, nutrient deficiencies uh, within those areas of plantation. Uh, the needles of the, um, of the trees um, that are sampled are analysed in a lab. And after the lab analysis, um, this drives uh, the main bulk of uh, our subsequent fertilising program to ensure um, best possible growth of uh, the trees. Now, the previous process for determining which plantations should be sampled was undertaken by each region separately and involved some automation, but also a significant amount of manual and potentially subjective editing of the results. The new process um, determines areas across the whole estate um, of the whole of Victoria to be sampled using consistent business rules. Manual intervention is uh, still necessary to refine the output. However, a significant number of checks are now made against the data to provide commentary to the assessors about the suitability of, uh, of the areas that have uh, been presented. Um, this very much allows, uh, as mentioned previously, the, the managing of data by exception and every possible area that satisfies the business rules is provided to the assessor and um, they just need to then get rid of those areas that uh, are not suitable due to, to factors that can't be accounted for in the process um, or where we just don't have uh, data for. Um, that means also that the assessors don't have to hunt around for areas of the plantation that uh, do satisfy the criteria because they're all, they'll all be there. Um, once the areas are, are finalised, um, we just randomly assign uh, sampling points across those areas, um, which uh, uses a bunch of other additional business rules as well. Um, so this, the centralising of this process means not only significant time savings, of course, but 
also a consistency of output, uh, both for HVP itself, but uh, also the, um, the third party that have both um, undertake the, uh, the sampling process and also uh, process the uh, results in the laboratory. Um, the third case study I was just going to mention is, uh, um, is documentation. Um, so as you can imagine with, uh, um, with the sort of large amount of growth that we've had using FME within the organization, we've also had a large amount of growth in the number of FME workspaces uh, floating around. Um, as you can imagine, the majority of them are for generally for sort of purpose, uh, personal use. So um, just fixing or, or um, um, fixing a problem uh, as it arises or undertaking a small task um, and don't necessarily have a, a, a bearing on the overall organization. However, there are a number of um, processes now, um, such as the ones mentioned previously, that have been used across the whole organization. And it's obviously very important to uh, keep track of these workspaces. So um, we've started using uh, FME itself to uh, document uh, FME. Um, so what we've been using is, uh, we've been adding a, a standard header to uh, any of our um, FME workspaces that are, are um, used corporate wide um, with a number of uh, um, part, uh, bits of information uh, and then we're using a uh, FME uh, workspace reader uh, to actually create summary documents, uh, documentation about uh, a particular um, workspace. So what it's meant is, um, well, this is still in, uh, um, in development, but uh, basically it allows us to, to uh, run the workspace reader against uh, any FME workspace and reading from that header information as well as uh, other parts of information that are embedded within the workspace itself. And we're able to now start uh, um, creating PDF documents that summarize our, our workspaces. Um, um, as a bit of a trial, um, I actually pointed the FME workspace summary workspace back at itself. Uh, to see whether it would generate a workspace summary for itself, uh, which it did. Likely it did sort of all implode into a black hole. So where to from here? So obviously there's, we've tackled a number of challenges in that sort of uh, very large growth of uh, FME and um, we're still, um, we're still coming to grips with, I suppose, some of the, uh, the big issues that uh, um, that growth uh, um, creates. So one of our main areas um, that we're trying to uh, grapple with, I guess, at the moment, which I imagine many organisations do, is, is around the, government's, the governance space. Uh, we're having an increasing number of uh, um, processes. Um, so we're, we're continuing to build uh, both new processes in FME, but also upgrading processes that sort of currently exist in other forms. Um, and this continuation of building processes has created one of our biggest challenges. Um, I guess uh, the main area of focus um, in the next uh, sort of short to medium term is to try and create and maintain standards for those corporate wide processes in particular. And that's also um, taking into account sort of not just the workspaces, but the potential for shared custom transformers and um, deriving some standardized templates as well. Um, and I guess a large driver of that governance in particular is the FME server. We're needing to ensure that FME server is gonna be utilized in a way that's both efficient and in particular secure. Um, and so we're trying to, uh, um, and that's probably one of the main drivers, I guess, for that governance is to ensure that's uh, what occurs. And we're also uh, looking to um, increasingly use FMA to um, either migrate data from old business systems into new or uh, potentially provide an interface for data moving between uh, business systems. Well, that is um, that's it for my presentation. So um, yeah.
Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Barrett. That was excellent. Um, we have got a question here. If what was the most surprising data inconsistency you found in your data when you started using FME to look at the data? Data inconsistency. Um, well, I think it's it's probably not so much. Um, I think sort of uh, it, it is interesting having those uh, separate regions. Um, it's not so much inconsistency, but it is the way in which uh, even though structures can be exactly the same, the way in which people interpret those structures. So while um, we might all be working off exactly the same schemas, there are some instances where uh, regions will use particular um, attributes in, um, to record uh, not different things, but things in different ways, I guess. Um, so I guess what it does allow for is, um, even though it's, it's nice to think of an FMA process as having uh, one size fits all, in some cases there, there may be a, a few or a couple or three streams where um, some minor um, transformations need to occur on a particular region to um, bring it into that uh, sort of consistent manner, I guess. Okay, thank you. I do have another one here. Um, you mentioned about the fact that you were giving information across to external contractors from the new yes. systems that you put into play. Did the external contractors have an understanding of what was happening with regard to the FME or was it uh, basically black box? Were they looking at that and seeing advantages? I think um, they weren't necessarily knowing where the data was or how the data was being derived, but um, there has certainly been feedback around the, um, I guess the, how fast it is for us to um, make changes where their requirements change. So um, in some instances, uh, there were contractors who were um, taking our data and then changing it for whatever reason. So it might be just changing the, file type or it might be uh, changing the um, uh, the coordinate system used or something like that. And so it was an interesting conversation to uh, talk to the, those um, contractors and simply say, tell me what you want and we will give it to you in, that, in the way you want it. So I think they've certainly um, benefited from that side of things and having things very much in a consistent uh, manner, but they don't necessarily know uh, what's driving it from behind the scenes, I guess. Okay, thank you. And we have another one here. Um, you, you mentioned the fact that you're implementing this new system. You started out with two and two, and now you've got five, one, and 10, <laughs> as far yep. as uh, licenses, et cetera, and people using it. And you've implemented uh, across the organization where it's pretty much become a corporate wise, even though we're regional, the staff mm -hmm. being introduced to these new systems, has there been um, a big learning curve or has it been relatively easy? And do, do you find that they uh, pick it up quickly or are they having to be trained on FME? Yeah, so certainly, um, so like with anything, um, there's always going to be a learning curve. Um, I think most of the staff that utilise it uh, quite consistently already have, I guess, that sort of um, workflow mindset, I suppose. So uh, working in a very sort of um, workflow oriented manner is, is, is not new to them. Um, anything with a new interface and new ways of doing things is going to introduce a, a certain level of, uh, of uh, learning. Um, but it's been picked up. I think it's, it's not so much that it's been picked up quickly, but I think it's um, people have been very um, willing to, to learn uh, simply because they can see the, the um, benefits that it provides. So I guess it's, uh, and as with anything, there's some people who um, grab it and run with it and never look back. Some people dabble around and, and it might not be until they find a specific project that they can really uh, tackle using it that they may uh, sort of uh, learn a bit faster. But in general, it's been 
it's been very well received. Um, majority of the people in the organisation that now use it all attended formal training. Uh, so I think that's extremely important. Um, and I still get plenty of phone calls and have plenty of chats about um, the best way of doing things. And, and what's really awesome is that there's been a few people who have, who have started to uh, um, show me things that I, I never knew as well. So it's, um, yeah, it's certainly been uh, very well received. Excellent. Thank you. And I can see there's another one here. Um, you mentioned about the two, you've had a number of case studies, but the first two case studies that you talked about were about measuring where, you know, for plants that had not taken off and you had to replant within a period of time and then you had the thinning. Has there been enough time yet to be able to quantify if there's been a, a, dr a dramatic improvement in production based on that? and the new system or is it still needing a bit more time? No, certainly with the survival assessments in particular. So that was the one where, where um, one-year-old plantations are inspected for their um, rate of survival. Um, yeah, they, um, the, the coordinator of that program estimated that we saved at least a week in terms of um, processing time or just, I suppose, um, collating the, all the data together. Uh, because it was able to be centralised and done within sort of a, a press of a button, uh, it meant that uh, we saved a, a significant amount of time on that. And um, particularly with that one, the results are, it's very important to get those out uh, prior to the current year's planting season so that uh, those areas can be sort of assessed for replanting if, if required. So, yeah, that one was quite easy to quantify and we're actually as I said we're looking for improvements or looking to make improvements for next year so we should see even better results next year. Uh, the foliar sampling that process um, that's in its sort of early stages at the moment so that's the one where we uh, test the, uh, the needles of the trees to determine uh, nutrient deficiencies but that um, is sort of uh, currently um, uh, in its early stages at the moment so but we're um, very uh, confident that, that we'll see some significant improvements in the uh, the overall efficiencies of that program as well. Excellent. Okay, thank you. I'm just looking to see if there's any more questions that have come in through the chat. And if there's anybody that has any questions that wanted to ask a question, I can't see anyone raising their hands. Okay, well, thank you very much, Barrett. It was excellent. And um, as always, um, your presentations at the World Fair and or World, World Tour, uh, excellent and much appreciated. Thank you again. All right, thank you. Okay, so our next part of the exercise or our presentation is where we are opening the floor for Q&A with our technical team and Christian Berger from SAFE, uh, desktop technical expert. Uh, so I would invite all of our presenters to put their videos up if they can and um, open the floor to any questions or if they've got anything that they want to talk about. Uh, Simon, Pre, as Sam, Tom, unfortunately, Assis will not be able to make it today. He's not well, uh, but, and Christian. Welcome all. Morning, everybody. Thanks for the introduction, Andre. And uh, thanks, Chris, for joining us as well from SAFE. It's great to have someone on, on the line from SAFE. My pleasure. <laughs> Just waiting to get my um, video started up here. <laughs> Excellent. I think Sam's on, on the line as well. As well as three. So I've had a few questions come through uh, like over the course of the past uh, week or the past four sessions of the World Fair that we've run. So we've answered some on the spot, some we've held over to really tackle today. 
So um, please feel free to keep sending any questions you have through, uh, through the chat, or also feel free to, um, if you'd like to, uh, you can raise your hand in Zoom under the reactions button and you can actually throw your question at us in person. So I might jump into these uh, questions that we've received and we've held over um, from the past few days. So the question we've had here is, what is the best place to find web connections and can you create your own? So that one has come through. I'm gonna just throw it out to the team, Chris included, whoever wants to sort of jump in and address that question. Yeah, absolutely happy to take this one on. Uh, so when it comes to connections in FME, one of the best places to look is honestly on the FME Hub. So if you're not familiar with the FME Hub, um, that's kind of a, the platform where users, partners, and safers alike are really uploading their, their transformers, their connections up to a common marketplace. And these are all freely available. Uh, all you have to do is download them. You can add them even from the quick add menu. So if you just type in, uh, say, if you wanted to look up CityWorks things, for example, if you just type in CityWorks, you'll see a load of different transformers that are available. But if you go onto the FME Hub, you'll see that there's actually a connection for CityWorks. So you can download that and then add it into your, your FME instance and then save the credentials that way. And after that, uh, if it's not available on the FME Hub, you can also create your own in the FME options uh, area as well. That's where you can define the service um, and do everything that your API documentation outlines. That's great. Thanks, Chris. Is it possible to actually upload a, a community connection to the hub? If you, for example, you've got some API that you're using, you're connecting to, Safe don't provide a web connection itself defining how that API works. Is it possible to upload something to the hub there that can then be shared with others? Yeah, definitely. So like I said, with the FME hub, that is all basically user-driven. So it's not an official marketplace by any means. There are some more official transformers and packages that are released by us, but otherwise, yeah, users are welcome to upload their own versions up there. Um, if you want it to, if you want it to stay more in your organization, you can also lock it down to a specific uh, group of users, or you could even use a shared uh, directory and share your credentials that way. Not credentials, but the connections. Rather. Fantastic. Thanks, Chris. Had another one here come through. Uh, and the question is, what transformers or features are best used when working with data via an API? So great question. John's really covered this off quite well uh, in his presentation, but um, I'll let others on the call and or John to jump in here and I guess discuss this one. This is a good one. I'm sure we've all got different opinions on what, what transformers we commonly defer to when we're dealing with APIs. So. Tom, let's start with you. What, what's your go-to? Um, uh, certainly the go-to format for me would be JSON, some, some form of that, um, and therefore all the JSON transformers that uh, to flatten messages and template messages, um, that would be what I'd be using to start with. Uh, but yeah, as you say, there's plenty of other options available to us, but that, that would be where I'd go uh, to start with. And... That's, that's a good starting point. Yeah. So Sam, which, which transformers would you defer to? Tom's taken my answer straight <laughs> out from me. <laughs> um, right. My immediate answer was going to be the JSON transformers because um, obviously a common, common thing we're working with APIs, um, the HTTP call or whatever, is dealing with the response bodies. And um, like personally, I actually, um, I typically um, package up custom transformers for particular projects that I'm working on, knowing that I expect particular um, formats and going to be doing it on a, like a repeating basis. Um, I do the same thing for um, when I pull the automation work workflow as well, get the, um, get the JSON string that's passed through automation. So JSON transformers, big, big thumbs up for me. <laughs> <laughs> great and chris do you have anything you want to add in there What's yeah i got a follow suit got a follow suit yep. with the json transformers if there was one in particular that i had to pick it would be the json formatter and that's just for the simple fact that you can format it so it's pretty print and just makes it so much easier to read so if you do need to go and expose certain elements from the json 
that's just a quick transformer to pop it through, take a quick look and see what your data looks like. Instead of having to read it through as a single line, it kind of just formats it nicely. So it's a lot easier to read. Definitely, I concur as well. Um, there's one thing we should also throw in there as well. There's a good article on the uh, FME Knowledge Hub around getting started with APIs. If, if, you've, if you're hearing us say API and you're, you're a bit unsure and uncertain as to what we're referring to, I'd recommend going and having a look at that uh, particular article because it really helps in giving you a good understanding of uh, APIs and how you can make the most of them using FME. Uh, so, out, Simon? Simon? yeah, I will. I will put that in. I'll give that to Andre to put in the uh, in the chat box. Um, next question we've had come through is, what reporting options are available within FME? So, Tom, I know you've done a lot of reporting in the past with FME. What What are your uh, yeah. thoughts well, on this? I'm currently doing a reporting project right now um, both um, HTML is pretty easy to do with, with FME you produce some nice little uh, formatted uh, web pages um, that you could produce say a validation report or something like that um, and just stream that back to a client maybe from a, an FME server um, app or something like that um, or you can um, build a PDF report as well, um, and you can do that through the PDF stylers, page layouters, um, and so on. Um, and whether you're using it as a validation thing or just um, a standard, uh, thank you for your data, this is what we've received, here's what it looks like as a report, um, it's now entered our system, or or whatever it is, um, yeah, we can do all of that. You can also um, be using that to go out, using FME rather, to um, write things into various dashboarding softwares, That's things like Tableau, Power BI, those sorts of things. Um, so you can have that the data effectively as a report um, coming through those sorts of systems as well, which um, other, other users might find um, a lot more easier to use than, than an FME um, process. And it's usually a bit more interactive as well, looking at those. Great, thanks, Tom. Sam, Chris, or uh, others on the call, anyone have any uh, other thoughts or opinions around generating reports using FME? I think that was a great, great summary. I think it really depends on what output you are looking for. Um, like Tom Definitely. said, it, it, you can do a lot of great things with HTML and PDF, but it really depends on what your needs are. Do you need some more user interaction? Then yeah, be a BI tool might be a little bit better. So I think you can use to prepare the data and send it up there. Um, if not, yeah, PDF and HTML are both great options. Yeah. I do them both a lot myself. <laughs> <laughs> The other one, I guess there are some other formats as well you can you can generate files for, whether or not you want to refer to them as a report. I'm not sure, but there's obviously... Excel. Uh, Excel, <laughs> Excel, yeah. Someone, it could just be a simple email. Yeah, exactly. email, yeah. or it could be, uh, you know, a Word, a Word document or something like that as well, where you can yeah. use a template and populate it with whatever your workbench is doing. So we had another question come through around, uh, I guess, connectivity and, and leveraging other forms of communication. And the question is, can I use FME to send a text message to field crews? So Chris, I might, I might throw this one over to you. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so with FME, there's uh, a couple of different options for sending out notifications. I would say the more common ones are probably things like an email, um, you could do things like a Slack message or people are now reaching out using Microsoft Teams as well. Text messages are still possible, but it does require a third-party service. Um, we do have a custom transformer that's available on the FME Hub called the, if I'm not mistaken, it's called the Twilio SMS Sender. And there's also a caller option as well. So it requires a third-party service called Twilio. Uh, if you have an account with them, then you can just enter in, I think it's just like your API key, um, your access token, and then your account ID, and then you're able to send out uh, text messages to your crews. So 
that way you can build all that logic into the workspace and have your teams notified. It's very interesting. It sounds quite um, interesting that you could use Twilio to actually call someone from FME. Mm -hmm. It's um, yeah, it's intriguing, but also concerning at the same time that you could actually call <laughs> call someone to say, "Here is the out output of your FME workbench. Um, I'm delivering the report in a verbal form using Twilio." Our service, our um, support departments, quivering at the thought. <laughs> I'm just having a look to see if there's any, been any further questions come through. But yeah, if you're on, if you're joining us here today, and you have any questions, feel free to uh, drop them in the chat window. Otherwise, uh, feel free to reach out to us at support at onespatial.com as well in the future. If you have any questions that you'd like us to uh, address, or you'd require some technical support with FME. Just checking to see if we've had any further questions come through. Um, with the, okay, here's another one that's come through. With the increased use of Teams, Zoom, and Slack, um, how are safe, so I guess it's one for you, Chris, um, how are safe are uh, planning to integrate these uh, into FME, either via connectors or transformers. So mm -hmm. Teams, Zoom, and Slack of the services. That is a great question. And I think we actually had, uh, earlier last week, we had a talk about the futures of FME, kind of just talking about the, the directions that um, all these different connections are going to have. And I believe there's a, a good segment in that. I don't want to quote it directly because I don't remember it off the top of my head. Uh, but there is a lot of good, good information on how we're going to be easily integrating um, solutions like that into automations. So I definitely recommend checking that out. And I can get the, the name of the talk and we can send it out in the chat as well. Um, but in terms of like things like Slack and Teams, we already have connectors uh, available for that. So all of these are kind of integrated into the workspaces already. Um, I, I personally use it on a daily basis. We use it to monitor our community uh, to make sure that when you are posting questions to, your, to the community, that our team are noticing them if they're not getting answers, just so we can make sure that they are getting uh, responses. And we're using that, uh, we're using that workspace to output to Slack just so we can easily see amongst our team, kind of put an emoji on it and say, okay, I've got this one, I've got this one. So we got a lot of different options there. It, I think for the most part, we're gonna be adding them through packages. I know the Microsoft Teams one is the most recent one where one of our colleagues, uh, she recently just posted that to the FME Hub. So that would again, be the best place to get all of those connector transformers. You start talking about um, integrating these in automations and I always get excited when I hear about automation integration, um, being able to very easily use these services at the top level. Um, makes it very easy to configure things as listeners and then invoke workbenches. Um, I'm always excited to hear it. So I'll, I'll definitely be looking it up personally. Yeah, I'm just going to uh, just going to post the uh, the Teams connector into the, uh, the chat because yeah, Christian, you're right. It's uh, it's only a few weeks old on the. Uh, on I think the it was team. only earlier this week, actually. Yeah. It's, oh, okay. Yeah, 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 last week about it. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah, the date on on there is 24th of April. So yeah, it's it's very hot off the press that one. So. And even uh, a cool thing with uh, with the Slack one in particular, another way we're using that in the office is not even to send out message, but actually to look at the reactions to a single message. So we're actually using it to schedule a coffee chats amongst our employees. So instead of sending out a message and saying like, okay, this is an update for the day, you're assigned to this coffee chat. People can react to the message with just an emoji saying like, uh, it's just like a coffee cup icon. Um, with all those emojis that you have the name that is, that's associated with who reacted to it. We're using automation to read that information in and then send out calendar invites to have those coffee chats. So there's a lot of different potential than just sending out messages because you can do it both ways where you're receiving information as well. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, really, really powerful, I guess, uh, use cases for these connectors within organizations, um, you know, once you figure out what it is you're trying to achieve. So that's great. Thanks, Chris. Uh, just 
checking to see if we've got any more questions come through. Nope, I don't think we do. So yeah, I think that's about it for the, this Q&A session. Thanks everyone for uh, continuing to remain on this uh, Zoom call for our fourth session of the World Fair. Uh, I'm now going to hand it back to Andre. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Chris. Pre, Sam, Tom, for uh, your answers. And I do believe, Jonathan, you were also there called upon. So thank you all very much for your uh, contribution and um, we'll like to take this opportunity to now uh, just wrap it up and just give you a bit of a run through on what one spatial FME services are provided. We are a highly skilled uh, certified staff globally throughout the one spatial organization with FME desktop accreditation, FME server, and also accredited FME trainers. We have been selling, supporting, and training FME since 2004 in Australia, and corporately across the One Spatial organization since 1999. So we've been working with SAFE for many, many years and uh, have quite a comprehensive team involved in the FME product. We are Australia's premier FME Platinum partner and corporately we are the uh, uh, FME uh, Platinum partner across one, uh, one Spatial PLC. We have a dedicated support for FME desktop, server and FME cloud. And we are one of three organisations in the world that are registered MSP for FME Cloud, so managed service providers or support providers. And we're quite proud of that fact. Services that we provide. We, we pride ourselves, and as I mentioned at the very beginning, we provide product and solutions for the spatial industry. And part of that is, is being able to go to organisations and working with them to evaluate what is the best for their needs and for their products or for their end results that they are looking to, to achieve. We provide FME consultancy services. So this can go in a number of different ways where an organization may wish to just engage one spatial to, to develop something as they require through a statement of works, et cetera, or they may have a situation where they, the organization has got FME experience and skills, but they don't have the capacity to get something done in the time frame required, we can come in and assist in that regard. We do public and bespoke training, and I'll talk about that in a bit more detail as we go through. And as always, our technical support. It's something that we're very, very proud of and quite well known for, that our support is second to none for FME. We uh, have a dedicated support at onespatial.com email address, and we encourage people to send their technical questions directly to that email address, or call us on our 1300 290 686, and uh, press the number one, which is priority for support. As I mentioned, with our FME training, we provide the three training courses that SAFE uh, have provided, being desktop basic, desktop advanced, and server authoring. We are accredited to provide these training courses. We do these at a face-to-face -face environment uh, at our one spatial training facilities. And naturally enough, because of COVID, we've had to travert, convert that through to uh, online, but we are slowly but surely now starting to go back to face to face. To get an idea of when these training courses are on, I'd welcome you to go to our website and look at our training schedule and uh, have a look at when it would can be convenient for yourself for any training that you may want to do. Should it be that the training is not suitable, we do run formal and custom training 
at either our training facilities or at on your premises. If you do want to find out more about that, please contact us at sales.australia at onespatial.com or again, call us on 1300 290 686 and press 2 for sales and training. Just to give you an idea of some of the things that we're going to be doing for the rest of the year, this is not by no means absolutely set in concrete. As uh, demand dictates, things do add, get added and uh, I would encourage you to go to our website to get the details of when they are on. But we will be running a Hot Features from the FME World Fair in next month, where we will be taking the best of what's been presented over the uh, two weeks that the World Fair has been on and putting it together for a short, sharp and informative uh, session. In July, we will be also running the GDA 2020. Late last year, we ran a webinar on GDA 2020. What we're now doing is going to do the next step where we're going to talk about where ha people have done it and are using it in their existing processes. We ran last year a number of speed dating with Don Murray, the president and C and founder, co-founder of SAFE Software in July. This proves to be a very successful and highly sought after episode uh, ep um, event where you can come along and ask Don any question that he may be, um, you may want to ask with no problems at all. So that will be in July. Now you can imagine that this will be under high demand. So please, if you are interested, get in contact with us to book your like book your place. FME server monthly uh, in August. Last year, we ran a webinar on FME Server, and from that, we realized that there was a need for us to run the, the server program over a more, more period, over a, a month, because there is so much information. We will also be talking about the one spatial products, one data gateway, and one uh, integrate in October, November, and again, another speed dating later in the, in the year. We will also be doing live events as we are starting to open up with COVID. We will be running hopefully a breakfast series to all major cities in September. We will be talking about all things that One Spatial has to offer. In September, we will be attending the Spatial Information Day conference in South Australia, which is highly, um, highly successful. We'll be running or going attending to the New South Wales ACT Regional Conference the Sydney build in November and in Victoria, we'll be going to the Surveying and Spatial Summit in November. I'd like to close off with the fact that it is the end of financial year here in Australia and the five reasons that you should be contacting One Spatial to maximise your end of financial year savings. Get the latest version of FME 2021 and receive 12 months free maintenance and support. If you have old licences of FME, Get the latest version, update it to be able to get your hands on the latest 2020.1, which includes many new features, which includes faster transformation, transformer speeds, increased automation, and new formats and system support. Engage One Spatial for consultancy work now and receive a 10% discount. As you can imagine, it, there's not much time left before the end of financial year, so get in quick to avoid disappointment. We will also uh, be offering uh, purchasing of one spatial products, one data gateway or one integrate and receive a 15% off the recommended retail price. And if you purchase FME training, you'll receive a 10% discount off the list price and you don't need to run it before the end of financial year. We can hold it for 12 months and you can run it at any time over the next 12 months. That way you can maximise your investment in this financial year to achieve a long-term growth and growing of your FME knowledge base amongst the, in your organisation. Again, this offer is valid till the end of June, so please hurry to maximise your savings. On that, I'd like to thank everybody for attending. For those of you that attended the four days that we have been running, thank you very much. If you only attended one or two, 
Again, thank you very much. I'd also like to have a big thank you to all of our customers that presented over the four days and to our team of uh, technical staff that have been here to answer technical questions. And a big thank you to SAFE, to Artie and to Chris for being online and helping us in our um, presentations over the last four days. And I'd look forward to catching up with everyone over the next year. And we look forward to catching up with everyone at next year's FME World Tour. Hopefully it will be back to live. Uh, if not, we will endeavor to do the World Fair again and uh, keep everyone safe. Thank you, everyone. And on that note, keep safe and goodbye.